Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 25, The Glories of Devotional Service, Text 34. Naikatmatam me sprihayanti kechen mat pada seva birata mat iha ye anyonyato bhagavata prasajya Sabhajayante Mama Porushani Naikat Matame Spriyanti Kechin Matpada Seva Virata Madiha Yen Yonyato Bhagavata Prasajya Yen Yonyato Bhagavata Prasajya Sabhajayante Mama Purushani Sabhajayante Mama Purushani Naikatmata Me Spriyayanti Kechin Naikatmata Me Spriyayanti Kechin Matpada Seva Virata Madiha Matpada Seva Virata Madiha Yen Yonito Bhagavata Prasajya Sabhajayante Mama Purushani Naikatmata Me Sprihayanti Kechin Matpada Seva Virata Madiha Yen Yonyato Bhagavata Prasajya Sabhajayante Mama Purushani Na Never Eka Atma Sorry Eka Atma Tam Merging into oneness Me My Sprihayanti They desire Kechit Any Matpada Seva The service of my lotus feet Abhirata Engaged in Matiha Endeavoring to attain me Yea, those who Anyonyata Mutually Bhagavata Pure devotees Prasajya Assembling Sabhajayante Glorify Mama Mai Purushani Glorious activities Translation A pure devotee who is attached to the activities of devotional service and who always engages in the service of my lotus feet never desires to become one with me such a devotee who's unflinchingly engaged always glorifies my pastimes and activities. Report by Srila Prabhupada. There are five kinds of liberation stated in the scriptures. One is to become one with the Supreme Personality of Godhead or to forsake one's individuality and merge into the Supreme Spirit. This is called a Ekatmatam. A devotee never accepts this kind of liberation. The other four liberations are to be promoted to the same planet as God, Vaikuntha, 
to associate personally with the Supreme Lord, to achieve the same opulence as the Lord, and to attain the same bodily features as the Supreme Lord. A pure devotee, as will be explained by Kapila Muni, does not aspire for any of the five liberations. He especially despises as hellish the idea of becoming one with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sri Prabodhananda Saraswati, a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya, said, Kaivalyam Narakayate. The happiness of becoming one with the Supreme Lord, which is aspired for by the Mayavadis, is considered hellish. That oneness is not for pure devotees. There are many so-called devotees who think that in the conditioned state we may worship the personality of Godhead, but that ultimately there is no personality. They say that since the absolute truth is impersonal, one can imagine a personal form of the impersonal absolute truth for the time being. But as soon as one becomes liberated, the worship stops. That is the theory put forward by the Mayavad philosophy. Actually, the impersonalists do, do not merge into the existence of the Supreme Person, but into his personal bodily luster, which is called the Brahma Jyoti. Although that Brahma Jyoti is not different from his personal body, that sort of oneness merging into the bodily luster of the personality of Godhead is not accepted by a pure devotee because the devotees engage in greater pleasure than the so-called pleasure of merging into his existence. The greatest pleasure is to serve the Lord. Devotees are always thinking about how to serve him. They're always designing ways and means to serve the Supreme Lord, even in the midst of the greatest obstacles of material existence. The Mayavadis accept the description of the pastimes of the Lord as stories, but actually they're not stories, they're historical facts. Pure devotees accept the narrations of the pastimes of the Lord not as stories, but as absolute truth. The words Mama Purushani are significant. <clears throat> devotees are very much attached to glorifying the activities of the Lord whereas the Mayavadis cannot even think of these activities. According to them, the absolute truth is impersonal. Without personal existence, how can there be activity? The impersonalists take the activities mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and other Vedic literatures as fictitious stories, and therefore they interpret, they interpret them most mischief, mischievously. They have no idea of the personality of Godhead. They unnecessarily poke their noses into the scripture and interpret it in a deceptive way in order to mislead the innocent public. The activities of Mayavad philosophy are very dangerous to the public and therefore Lord Chaitanya warned us never to hear from any Mayavadi about any scripture. They will spoil the entire process and the person hearing them will never be able to come to the path of devotional service to attain the highest perfection, or will be able to do so only after a very long time. It is clearly stated by Kapila Muni that bhakti activities or activities in devotional service are transcendental to mukti. This is called panchama purusharta. Generally, People engage in the activities of religion, economic development, and sense gratification. And ultimately they work with an idea that they're going to become one with the Supreme Lord, Mukti. But Bhakti is transcendental to all these activities. The Srimad Bhagavatam, therefore, begins by stating that all kinds of pretentious religiosity is completely eradicated from the Bhagavatam. Ritualistic activities for economic development and sense gratification and after frustration and sense gratification the desire to become one with the Supreme Lord are all completely rejected in the Bhagavatam. 
The Bhagavatam is especially meant for the pure devotees who always engage in Krishna consciousness, in the activities of the Lord, and always glorify these transcendental activities. Pure devotees worship the transcendental activities of the Lord in Vrindavan, Dwaraka, and Mathura, as they are narrated in Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas. The Mayavadi philosophers completely reject them as stories, but actually they're great and worshipable subject matters, and thus are relishable only for devotees. That is the difference between a Mayavadi and a pure devotee. Naikatmata me sprihayanti ke jin, matpada seva birata madiha. Yen yon yato bhagavata prasajya sabha jayante mamapurushani. A pure devotee who is attached to the activities of devotional service and who always engages in the service of my lotus feet never desires to become one with me. Such a devotee who is unflinchingly engaged always glorifies my pastimes and activities. Amyana to Miranda Siakin and Janashala Kaya Chakshamila to me that has my Sri Guru Venama. Sri Chitani Mano Bishlam Stafitani and Aputale. So I am Rupa Gadam, I am Dadati Swapitantikama. Manjikapa to Rubius Jack Rivers and Rubiavacha. Padidanam Pavanabio Vaishnavi on a monomaha. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanajananda. She had a very good adha. She was city core of Octobrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. So Lord Kapila is again <coughs> continuing on with his glorification of the process of devotional service and his comparison, making comparison between devotional service and other spiritual processes and illustrating clearly how the process of devotional service is the supreme process. There's no process higher. There's no process higher. And particularly, as we heard the last two days, a couple of days ago, he said, Bhaktir Siddhi Gariyasi. Bhakti is superior to any other perfection. And that particularly included the perfection which is called impersonal liberation. So this is a very popular practice and popular goal amongst persons who are engaged in spiritual life. And even we mentioned that in other religious traditions, these other concepts also appear. Like we mentioned that in Islam, the emphasis is on the impersonal. God is, it's considered to be, actually it's considered to be heresy. And you can possibly be punished even with death for trying to substantiate within Islam that God is a person. Although on the other hand they also refer to God as him and he and having personal characteristics like feelings. He likes things, he doesn't like other things. Like this. Then in Christianity, I don't know so much about Judaism, but in Christianity, we find that the absolute truth is described in both ways, personal and impersonal. When Christ was on the cross, he was appealing feelingly to his father, to forgive them, forgive those people who were, who had been persecuting him. So, something, something, which is not personal and does not have personal characteristics, cannot forgive. Not actually. <clears throat> but then, on the other hand, God is sometimes described in that same literature as being light. Were the word like this. In the beginning they say in the beginning there was God or in the beginning there was the word and the word was 
with God, if I remember correctly. And the word was God. So this is somewhat impersonal. God is light. When various persons are uh, meant to have seen him, they saw some dazzling light and it was quite overpowering. So we find in that tradition, both the impersonal and personal aspects are presented, but not very clearly, not in specific terms, that there is an impersonal feature and it is like this, and there is a personal feature and it is like that, and there are certain differences and the specific characteristics of both features that we don't find just some general type of reference but in the Vedic literatures we find very detailed description descriptions of the impersonal feature what that is and so many things about it then of course particularly the personal feature of the absolute truth the supreme personality of Godhead and what he looks like how he thinks his feelings his forms his qualities and his pastimes these are all described in the Vedic literatures and here we see particularly that the distinction is being made very clearly in this verse and very clearly in the purport by Srila Prabhupada so all these features are described, all these aspects of the Absolute Truth are described very clearly in the Vedic literatures, which is very helpful. It's helpful to know what you're doing or what you're meant to be striving for. It helps to know clearly rather than some vague way. <coughs> Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakwa in Harinam Chintamani gives a very nice description of how the devotee realizes Krishna gradually through the process of devotional service through the process of devotional service founded on based upon the name the holy name of the Lord so this chanting of the holy name of the Lord of course we understand in this Kali Yuga this is the primary activity to be focused on amongst the many activities within devotional service. So the chanting of the holy name is like the basic platform from which one can develop in Krishna consciousness. And of course that holy name is the Lord. The Lord is personally present in his name. He is not different from his name. So when a devotee becomes very advanced and the devotee is chanting Hare Krishna the devotee will directly perceive Krishna in person dancing on his tongue and dancing into his ears and into the heart actually and taking up his place in the heart of the devotee so it's all based on the chanting of the holy names so Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes the point that in this context the holy name is the Lord uh, the Lord in this form is like a great ocean and as you go into the ocean of the holy name and you actually start to advance and re begin to realize something the first thing the next thing at least you'll realize is the form of the Lord so he says that the form of the Lord is like the waves in the ocean the ocean is not just simply some sort of nondescript entity but the ocean has many waves and they're moving active so the forms of the Lord are like waves in the ocean and they're realized the forms are realized through the name in fact they're implicit within the name then next is when one as one is advancing further with the name and realizing further the form of the Lord then naturally as one realizes progressively the form of the Lord one will begin to realize the qualities of the Lord because the form of the Lord 
is not some nondescript form. There are so many different features and characteristics and qualities. So these qualities of the Lord, which are gradually realized by the devotee, <coughs> Bhaktivinoda Thakur says these are like the small secondary waves in the ocean, if one looks carefully one will see that not only are there the big waves rolling through, but on the big waves, there are many little waves, ripples and so on, like that. And they're features of the waves, the big waves. So these then correspond in Bhaktivinoda Thakur's example to the qualities of the Lord, which are realized within the form, within the person, as parts of the personal characteristics of the Lord. And then those qualities, as the devotee advances further in chanting, it's always based on chanting. Not that one goes from the chanting into another aspect and leaves the chanting, but based on the chanting, the devotee goes further on, realizing the form more deeply through the name, realizing the qualities more deeply through realizing the form more deeply and perceiving the qualities within the form. And then the devotee realizes the pastimes. And what are the pastimes? Pastimes mean the form of the Lord, the Lord, with his, according to his qualities, he's interacting. He's interacting according to his qualities in so many extraordinary and very attractive ways. So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says in his example of the ocean that the devotee realizes the pastimes of the Lord and these pastimes are like the interactions between the waves. All the different waves mixing in different ways and in this way coming up with all different types of situations and configurations and like this. A very nice example. Very nice example. How the Supreme Personality of Godhead is progressively realized by pure devotees. Beginning with the name. Beginning with the name. And always based on the name. So this feature of the Absolute Truth, the personal feature, is far nicer and is actually superior to that impersonal feature. The impersonal feature which, like in the Christian tradition, they might refer to as the light or as, I forget what his name was, but in that famous movie they had the saying, May the Force be with you. Did you ever hear of that? What was that? Star Wars. May the force be with you. So they don't want to say that may the forceful put his force behind you or something like that. Because they're kind of impersonally tinged, actually. That is their attitude. May the force be with you. You're a person, and as a person, you have force. And we recognize that in general, in the universe, there, there is force, great force. And we see that we are persons and we have force. And here's a great force, but we, we don't think, we won't think that there must be a great forceful person behind it. So we say, may the force be with you and all glory is to the force. One devotee actually <coughs> has approached that man, what's his name? Anyway, the man who put that whole thing together, very famous and wealthy man, Steven Spielberg, and suggested to him that they make a sequel. And in the sequel, they show who's behind that famous force. Yeah, what it's really all about, ultimately. So I don't know what's going to happen of that idea. But the Supreme Personality with all his variegated and most wonderful qualities and characteristics and activities and relationships 
is superior to that impersonal spiritual force described by the Muslims they're very keen on it this impersonal aspect of energy and light and like this potency or the Christians as light or whatever uh, so this personal feature is much higher and in our Vaishnav tradition the point is regularly made that if someone gets sidetracked to take an interest in this impersonal feature which is not at all so nice no personality, no activities, no feelings, no relationships. So if people get sidetracked from approaching the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> they get sidetracked towards that impersonal, non-personal, depersonalizing, impersonal feature of the Absolute. This is seen to be most unfortunate, very unfortunate. It's something like going a long way, a great effort to achieve a great goal, but at the last minute you fail miserably and lose everything. Like that. So this, the people who propound this impersonal philosophy, this depersonalizing philosophy, which makes people less than persons, it makes them into things. This impersonal philosophy and the people who propound this impersonal philosophy, they are extremely, uh, very much not appreciated by the devotees, the personalists. Very, very much the devotees don't appreciate them. And actually in India, over the centuries there's been great conflict between the two schools of thought even to the point of actual conflict as such Srila Prabhupada you may have heard when Srila Prabhupada first came to America he was preaching and gradually young people were coming over over a period of little time 1966 some young people were coming I was just reading yesterday in one book about those early days that in 1966, Prabhupada of course started his preaching in 1965 in America, in sort of mid-65 or so. And by the end of 1966, he'd been preaching more or less a year and a half, and the movement was starting. Prabhupada had initiated 19 disciples at the end of 1966. So just a small beginning, few people, small number of people coming, and some small number of people getting involved and they were all very very uneducated in Vedic philosophy and Vedic concepts completely new to them most of them had never heard of Krishna even so Srila Prabhupada was preaching and Srila Prabhupada of course preaching very intensely and in very logical ways addressing their situations and helping them to get out of their material situations and to take to Krishna consciousness nicely. But the devotees, those very, very new young boys and girls, they noticed that regularly, every class almost, Srila Prabhupada at, at some point or another would start talking about the Mayavadis, the impersonalists, the Mayavadis and how they're very bad and you shouldn't have anything to do with them like this so the devotees had never heard of, of Mayavadis they didn't know what a Mayavadi was they couldn't really, they hadn't yet really caught on to what an impersonalist was but here Srila Prabhupada was strongly deprecating and almost haranguing these Mayavadis as being highly highly undesirable very very undesirable so one devotee told the story of how after one of those early classes in 1966 
he got together with some of the other new devotees and they're talking about how Swamiji has really got it in for these Mayavadis, whoever they are. And they were saying, well, look, you know, they're obviously... Why doesn't he get on the case of the Christians or the people like that? And then they decided that actually, probably what it must be is that Swamiji, he's an elderly man. He was already in his early 70s. He's an elderly man, and he must have had some bad experience with some of these Mayavadi people. And it just really irritated him too much and has become like a pet eight. So when he gets worked up in a certain mood, it just comes out, these Mayavadis. But they thought, no, it's irrelevant. And one boy, it may even be in the Lila Rita, it's in one of these biographical books. One boy, Srila Prabhupada's giving class, and one boy puts up his hand and asks a question that I've read in such and such's version of Bhagavad Gita. I'm reading such and such's ver version of Bhagavad Gita and there it says something impersonal. And Srila Prabhupada got very angry. Very angry. And the boy was a little bewildered. It's Bhagavad Gita. It's saying this in Bhagavad Gita. What's the problem? Prabhupada got very angry and told him never to read that Bhagavad Gita again and never to mention anything from it. So it took him some time to digest that. But it's a fact that the impersonal philosophy is very dangerous actually. As Srila Prabhupada said in his Vyasa Puja poem to his spiritual master in, I forget exactly when it was, maybe 1935 or so, uh, absolute is sentient, thou hast proved. Impersonal calamity thou hast removed. Hmm. So it's taken to be like that. Calamitous. If you become influenced by the impersonal philosophy and if you take up impersonalism and lose your interest in the personal feature and the process of devotional service, so, sometimes, actually Lord Chaitanya, he said, Mayavadi Basya, Shunale Haya Sarva Nasha, that anyone who listens to that Mayavad, impersonal philosophy, then Haya Sarva Nasha, everything will be destroyed, everything will be lost, especially the pure Mayavad. Pure, I mean pure in the sense of as it really is. Of course it's very impure, but as it is in and of itself. That philosophy is created by Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva <coughs> is a form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he's highly intelligent. Actually he has that supreme transcendental intelligence, or at least some significant part of it. And Lord Shiva, he is the embodiment of Tamagun. He's the embodiment of the mode of ignorance. So on one hand, he's so extremely intelligent, practically like God. And on the other hand, he is embodying the entire potency <coughs> of the mode of ignorance. So this Mayavad philosophy is the specific contribution of Lord Shiva in the form, in his form as Shankaracharya. And what this Mayavad philosophy means is that someone with the intelligence practically of God is presenting a philosophy which is also simultaneously the complete embodiment of ignorance. But because he's so extremely brilliant then, then it's such a brilliant presentation. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur, commenting on this fact, he says that if anyone reads that actual Mayava philosophy, as given by Lord Shiva, Shankaracharya, 
which completely embodies the potency, the, the sum total potency of the mode of ignorance, and is presented so brilliantly with the intelligence practically of God, that unless they're actually Mahabhagavats, they will fall down. They'll not be able to stop. Unless they're actually transcendental. And he says even those who are on the earlier stages, the beginning stages of Mahabhagavat, they may be affected also. Because it's such an extraordinary philosophy. So it's very dangerous. Mayavadi Basya Shunale Haya Saravanasha. Nowadays, of course, we meet the occasional, you could say, like we have neo Protestant Christians. The Protestants are already neo. And then you get the neo Protestants. So you get neo Mayavadis. I won't mention any names, but they're the, po the popular figures in India. They're neo-mayavadis. They're not really the real thing. So, of course, they're able to bewilder the common people. But fortunately, because the philosophy is not actually mayavad as it is, when the devotees hear the philosophy, generally they don't become bewildered, but they can even defeat it, because it's like a very foolish presentation of that philosophy. But the actual philosophy, as it is presented by Lord Shiva himself, that is something that is beyond the capacity of anyone other than the most extremely qualified devotee to be able to deal with. And therefore, Lord Chaitanya, his instruction basically was, avoid it. Just don't have anything to do with it. So it's also very dangerous. It's very dangerous in different ways. As we mentioned, it depersonalizes. Actually, not only depersonalizes, it depersonalizes but Srila Prabhupada also expressed it in another way, stronger, that it's like a form of spiritual suicide. And of course, suicide, killing yourself, killing anyone, is very, very bad. Very bad indeed. So it's a form of spiritual suicide because we are actually eternal persons. So if we take up some process, the goal of which, the idea of which is that we cease to become persons and we just, in an impersonal state, we just merge with the greater impersonal absolute and become part of it and actually lose our identity, become one with God. This is spiritual suicide. You are killing yourself. So, this is very terrible, actually. Very terrible. <clears throat> so this Mayavad philosophy, real Mayavad at least, we have to avoid very, very much. Prabhupada here is, has quoted Prabodhananda Saraswati. We mentioned, I think, yesterday, Kaivalya Narakayate, that the devotee sees that impersonal state as being Narakayate, just like hell. And of course, to kill yourself means you're already in some sort of hellish state. So confused and disturbed. So spiritual suicide is just like hell for the devotee to lose the opportunity of one's natural eternal relationship with Krishna. Most, most unfortunate. Prabhupada also makes the point uh, that, he's making the point here, that even these Mayavadis, sometimes they have some idea that you must worship. When you're in the, the embodied state, you must wor worship embodied concepts, higher embodied concepts, to elevate you to some higher level. And then from that higher level, you may approach the impersonal absolute. So they say, it's a little technical, but they say that Krishna... Vishnu and personalities like that. They are, they are like personalized entities, like we are personalized entities. But they're on a higher level than us. And they're closer to the absolute truth than us. They're closer. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says very clearly, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. I'm the source of the Brahman. So of course the Mayavadis 
they interpret that in some other way but the point is that they say that Krishna is closer to the absolute than we are we are in a very lowly state so seeing Krishna is closer if we worship Krishna and come up to his level then when we come up to his level we're closer to the absolute truth and then from that level we can directly approach the absolute truth therefore now in this state we should worship Krishna and that will help us but once we have got up to that level and then from that level we've succeeded actually in going further and realizing the impersonal absolute then we don't need Krishna then we can say goodbye Krishna and turn our back on him and leave him and forget about him Srila Prabhupada gives the example of the yoga ladder that in a certain understanding of the yoga ladder all the different yogas are like the different rungs and they're to take you up to the point of absolute realization but when you've gone up through all the steps and you come to the, stop, the top step in the ladder the means of achieving the goal and then you've actually stepped from there into the absolute realm then you don't need the ladder you can kick the ladder away so it's a kind of abusive attitude that they have we'll use Krishna till we come up to his level and then go beyond his level then we'll just kick him away or as the concept is there in so-called Zen Buddhism some schools of it at least that you accept a guru and you learn from him and eventually you learn everything that he knows and then you become guru and then you kill him because you don't want to have two gurus as they say when if you find Buddha on the road kill him so these these are demoniac types of ideas and this idea also of using Krishna to help us become elevated and then when we've gone past him kick him away who needs him this is also a demoniac idea so these impersonalists they're like that depersonalized depersonalizing and abusive so the devotees don't appreciate this idea they certainly of course they understand that Krishna has his impersonal feature his energy his spiritual energy just like all of us we are persons but we also have our impersonal feature we have our energy when you're exerting your energy doing something then that energy is a some uh, facility you have at your control a little different from you you're the energetic you're using that energy so Krishna has his energy Krishna has his energy and that energy is impersonal and that energy of Krishna's body is actually like a brilliant light the Brahma Jyoti we are reading in Sri Shapanishad if you recall when we went through all the verses that the last section particularly verses 15 and 16 the speaker is appealing to Krishna that I want to see you I want to see your face and and relate with you personally but at this point the dazzling effulgence of your body is I can't see through that to see you Krishna has so much potency spiritual potency that that Brahma Jyoti that Krishna is effulgent so effulgent that unless you have the key how to see through the effulgence you'll be blinded by the effulgence sometimes we see when devotees are very Krishna conscious they also become effulgent you may have seen that and some days if they're not so Krishna conscious you'll see they're not very effulgent like if you look at Yasumati Nandan Prabhu's head where he's shaved his head there on the top well you'll see there's an effulgence <laughs> sometimes the devotees when they're going out distributing books they try to disguise themselves put on a wig and you know with kami clothes and so on 
take off their tilak. <coughs> but the effulgence can be a great problem in that you meet people and if they've had a little association they know that Hare Krishnas are prone to be effulgent because Krishna's there in them and nature and Krishna's so effulgent and that shows through the devotee. So the devotee approaches someone in a disguised condition, disguised state, gives a book and tries to sell them a book and they say, Oh, Hare Krishna. And the devotee says, No, no, no. We're not Hare Krishna. No, you're Hare Krishna. No, we're not Hare Krishna. I can tell you're shining. <laughs> so it can be a hazard, actually. But devotees, enlivened devotees, they definitely become effulgent sometimes. Because Krishna is there and Krishna is effulgent and that is showing in the devotee. There's one interesting story you may have heard. <coughs> in 1976, Prabhupada went to the New York Rathayatra and the devotees were waiting for Prabhupada to arrive so they could begin and the police were there and they were also waiting so Prabhupada drove up and got out of his car and started to approach the Rathiyatra car and one devotee tells the story how he was there and he saw there's Prabhupada and there are two New York cops did I mention this story last time when I was it's a nice story Two New York cops. Any of you who have been to New York, New York would know what I mean by a New York cop. They're, they're the real thing. They're the real thing. They're not like our South African sissies. <laughs> they are the real thing. They're really tough guys. So there are these two New York cops just hanging out waiting. And Prabhupada arrives. And they're just sort of hanging out. And then one of them sees Prabhupada. And the devotee's standing right next to him. So the one who sees Prabhupada, it's like he gets a shock. And he grabs his friend, says, Hey, I can't put on the New York accent, but hey, look at that guy. He's glowing. <laughs> so they're both very happy to see Prabhupada glowing transcendentally. So Krishna glows so much that it's dazzling. And unless you've got the key to penetrate through, you won't be able to tell what it is. You'll just see this light and you'll think, well, that's that. That's God. And this is what the, happens with the impersonists sometimes. If they actually realize, then it's such an overpowering experience that they feel, yes, this is definitely, this is it. This is the supreme. There couldn't be anything superior. But actually it's the effulgence of Krishna's body. And naturally Krishna's body is behind it. And as that devotee in Ishapanishad is praying, that you pl please remove the effulgence so I can see you. So the key to seeing through the effulgence and actually perceiving Krishna's body, the effulgent body of Krishna, the key of course is love of God. The key is love of God. Jiva Goswami explains in uh, oh, Bhagavad Sandarbha that when the impersonalists realize Brahman, they are realizing Krishna personally. It's actually Krishna they're seeing. But because they don't have bhakti, they can't see through the effulgence. So they only see the effulgence. And, in other words, they're seeing Krishna, but they're not seeing his form, they're not seeing his personality. They're only seeing the effulgence. So through bhakti, the devotee can see Krishna through the effulgence, through the material coverings, like within the hearts of the other living beings. And he can see Krishna in the form of the deity, which otherwise may look like a statue. You can see Krishna in the pictures, which may look just like some paint or ink on paper. But he sees Krishna through bhakti, through devotion. So this bhakti, personal bhakti, has to be protected, has to be protected from the possible influences of impersonalism. Impersonalism. 
taking persons, taking other living beings to be less than real persons just like us. And Prabhupada of course made the point that he composed that second pranam prayer which we use, Namaste Saraswati Devi Kauravani Prachani, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Dejadharani, that he came as the servant of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati to deliver the Western countries which are overcome by voidism and impersonalism. And we might wonder, where's the voidism? Where's the impersonalism? But Srila Prabhupada was seeing it there and seeing it as being very dangerous and preaching against it, even in, like in how it's present in the Western world, like abortion. Kill the baby in the womb. Impersonal. Of course, if it was, the baby was born, and the baby is now outside the womb, even just for one day, and you suggest, well, let's just kill this one, why not? Can't afford to support it. Then no one will accept that. Because at the time of birth, they then sort of accredit the child with being a person. But prior to that, within the womb, no, it's not a person, it's just a thing. Kill it and throw it in the rubbish bin. This is impersonalism, depersonalizing. Racism, the same thing. Sexism, speciesism. That these cows and sheeps and chickens and fish, we can just kill them and eat them, doesn't matter. They're less than us. Actually, they're not. They're all eternal spirit souls. They're all eternal persons. But they're just externally embodied differently in more lowly forms. But they themselves, as living entities, they're not less. So, impersonalism, actual impersonalism as such, encourages such ideas. And in this way, encourages the general state of degradation in Kali Yuga. Whereas personalism, particularly pure Krishna consciousness, encourages personalism on all levels. On all levels. So it's not simply a matter of you making your own spiritual advancement. It's actually a matter of a whole world view and influencing the whole of society to understand things in a nicer way, in a more correct way, and on the basis of that understanding of things to make the whole of life much nicer on this planet. So this is very important, this personal feature. And Lord Kapila is stressing here, and he's going to continue to stress for the next few verses in very beautiful ways about the wonderful personal feature of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Any comments or questions? Shri Prabhupada preaches a lot against impersonalists and um, we hear how far away they are from Krishna with their, their attitude. Yet on the other hand, as explained, when they merge into Krishna's impersonal feature, they're actually merging into Krishna's body. And um, also in Bhagavad Gita, there are various references which actually explain how the Maya my body is actually um, are actually ex experiencing the same absolute truth. And also, yesterday I was reading, Sri Prabhupada was discussing in the purport, um, the verse was indicating how one serves the Mahatma. And then Prabhupada made the statement that actually there's two types mm. of Mahatma. In the fifth canto. Yeah. yeah. So I was right. wondering. Well, it's an intriguing situation. Yeah, it's an intriguing situation. Even Narada Muni, in the seventh canto, he talks about how the enemies of the Lord, uh, through anger, he talks about how different people achieved the Lord. He said, Shishupal, through envy, Kamsa, through fear, the gopis, through lust, He's speaking to Maharaj Yudhisthira. He says, you Pandavas, through
through having a family relationship, you all achieved Krishna. Then he talks about the enemies, uh, Kamsa and Shishupal, how they achieved Krishna. And he says, for them, their remembrance in that mood, their different moods of anger, envy, and fear, and like that, negative moods, their fixedness on Krishna was, as far as I can see, he says, it's much stronger than mine. Although he's included himself already in the list, that's some through serving, and he is included as in that category, through regulated devotional service. But these people who achieved who fixed their minds on Krishna in a negative sense and were just obsessed in a hateful way, thinking of Krishna all the time. It seemed to me that their connection with Krishna was much stronger than mine, just in the sense of how forcefully their minds were riveted on Krishna in that mood of extreme <coughs> anger. Whereas me, you know, I was serving in a mood of love, but it didn't wasn't like such a powerful connection with Krishna. So, and they also were liberated. So, you know, then he says, well, maybe it would be better to hate Krishna because you become more Krishna conscious and you also become liberated. But then it's explained very clearly that those enemies they don't actually achieve Krishna in his personal form. They only achieve the Brahma Jyoti, the impersonal feature. And in the impersonal feature, first of all, the pleasure is not so great by any means. It's compared to the amount of water in the hoof print of a calf, compared to the amount of water in a great ocean. So the benefit, you could say, of what they achieve is far less far less. On another hand, it's temporary and they have to fall back down again after some time. Whereas the devotees who enter the personal pastimes of the Lord, they experience greater pleasure and it is eternal. It is eternal. They stay in the kingdom of God. Then, on the other hand, we understand that because of this idea of it being spiritual suicide, and any time we think of suicide, that, that we know that's something very bad. So actually, then, then this statement of Prabodhananda Saraswati applies. Kai valya narakayate. Suicide means hellish condition. So in fact, they really achieve a hellish condition, actually. And naturally, and in fact, the point is made that these people are demons. So what do you expect? What do you expect demons to achieve? That they go back to Godhead and get eternal life full of bliss and knowledge in love with God? You can't expect that. So then Prabhupada explains that actually going to the hellish planets, which normally happens to the demons, uh, or those demons who go to the Brahma Jyoti, Actually, it's the same thing. It's like a trick of the Lord. It's like a trick of the Lord. That it appears, oh, they're getting liberated. Gosh, that's very wonderful. But actually, it's hellish. And it's temporary. And the experience is not so nice anyway. They fall back down. So Prabhupada explains that, that it's really not, not so different from going to the hellish planets. So it's like a trick. It appears to be something beneficial, but actually it's not really beneficial. Something like that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You said earlier about how uh, some of the characteristics of the ocean um, describe the qualities of Krishna. Yeah. I was wondering how the characteristic of that every seventh way seems to be so much larger than the rest. Aha! Uh -huh. Interesting point. It may not be related. <laughs> As we said the other day, some, one of the Madhajis was asking <coughs> about, you know, we have an analogy. What was that analogy? You know, I forget which, that particular analogy. And it was sort of appropriate, applicable in certain respects, but then you start going into other aspects of it 
and it doesn't work as far as you know the point we're trying to get at so i don't really think that you know if if it is a fact and i must say i come from a surfing background so and it's not really a fact that every seventh wave is a big one it's kind of you know unpredictable it's not it's certainly not totally predictable by any means so even if it was though that actually every seventh wave one two three four five six seven's a big one and